Okay, we're here with James DiEugenio. He's the editor and publisher of Kennedy'sAndKing.com. Uh, we have some audio of Jim Garrison speaking in 1967, I believe. Jim has listened to it. I don't think it's been heard probably since the 70s. It came from uh, Pacifica Radio Archive. So Jim's listened to it. Do you want to give us a little introduction to this rare bit of audio? Yeah. I, I think this is either late 67 or early 68, um, very early 68. It's a, it's a banquet for the Southern California Broadcaster Association at the Century Plaza Hotel. And I think it was the L.A. Free Press who invited Garrison there. They had an article about him on the front page, which he refers to in the talk. When he's talking about Art, the guy named Art, that's Art Kunkin. Art Kunkin was the owner and publisher of the L.A. Free Press. The L.A. Free Press was, well, what, where do you begin with this? In my opinion, there were two paradigms of journalism, two peaks of journalism in the 1960s, which nobody has matched since. For a glossy magazine, it was Warren Hinkle's Ramparts. For a weekly tabloid, it was the LA Free Press. They weren't afraid to go anywhere, and this included supporting Jim Garrison. Garrison was so harshly attacked in the early part of the summer of 1967. If you recall, it was by Hugh Ainsworth in Newsweek, by James Phelan in the Saturday Evening Post, and then by Walter Sheridan. Uh, Ainsworth was actually infiltrated into Shaw's defense team. Uh, Phelan testified at Shaw's trial. Sheridan was in contact with the CIA, and he was getting funding from the CIA. Once that hit, most of the media turned on Garrison. This, of course, led to Garrison sort of calling out the media for being so bad on the JFK case. If a government can lie so blatantly about something as important as the John F. Kennedy assassination, that means that they can basically get away with murder. He names a very famous article that was published around this time. I think it was in the Saturday Evening Post, but I'm not sure. Tom Braden, who was masquerading as a journalist at that time, wrote an article saying something like, the title was, Glad the CIA is Immoral. Very few people knew that Tom Braden was a former CIA agent Okay, at, you know, when, when that article was published, all right? They certainly knew after it was published. All right. Um, and so Garrison mentions that article. This is his beginning to really go head to head with the Central Intelligence Agency around this time. All right. Uh, I, I imagine it's from the Pacifica Archive, right? Yeah, definitely is. All right. So I, I urge everybody to listen to this. It's kind of interesting. Great. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction, and we'll play it right now. This is Leonard Brown. Like the murders of the three civil rights workers in Mississippi and those of Medgar Evers and Mrs. Violet Liuzzo, the murder of John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas, was and is, in the legal sense, crime without punishment. Thus it seems, in terms of the crime itself, to represent the prototypical expression of a violent society. But, in its aftermath, its implications range far beyond such a society's conventional process of punishing violence with yet more violence. This murder permanently marred what we have called the American dream, staining ambition and high aspiration with a tragic serum of futility. Grow up, it seemed to say, and be president's son, and be killed by your people. This murder said other things to other men, attorney Mark Lane for one, and Jim Garrison, district attorney in New Orleans for another. To these two lawyers, the formality was broken, interrupted in the freeze-frame moment of the crime itself. Like many Americans, they were troubled by the simplicity of the Warren Commission report, which reduced the whole equation to one man, one moment, one madness. Here, in a speech before the Southern California Broadcasters Award Dinner, is Jim Garrison, whose investigations into the murder of President John F. Kennedy have compelled a closer scrutiny of the abrupt and savage end of the new frontier era in American politics. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be invited here, uh, particularly after reading some of the things that I've read about me in the press. I think it's very gracious of, uh, of the radio and television press in Southern California to invite me to eat in the same room with them. And I'm glad to see that my friends from NBC are here, too, because... <laughs> NBC, as you know, is the, has such a burning interest in the right of the people to know. So, Art mentioned uh, that I had a message, and curiously enough, uh, in a sense, he touched on the message when he mentioned the magazine article that he had in his hands. He showed it to me a few minutes ago, and it caused me to make some notes because, essentially, what my message is, is simply that the government does not have the right to lie. If a government has a right to lie, it has a right to murder. And I can assure you, any government which is able to get away with a lie will get away with murder. Because the name of the situation you have when a government is allowed to lie, to lie with equanimity is fascism. That's all it is, fascism. And when you reach the point as we seem to have reached, where you can have magazine articles with, with men writing articles such as the government has a right to lie, or I'm glad the CIA is immoral, what you've reached is a point of acceptability in certain areas of fascism. And I think it's a time to become concerned because that's what the Kennedy assassination is all about and the fraudulent concealment of what really happened. That's what it is all about, too. The fact that some degree of fascism has arrived in our country. You recall that George Santayana said that those who do not learn from history are condemned to relive it. And if we have not learned from our experiences before and during the Second World War, what fascism is, then we, in time ourselves, will be condemned to relive the very history that they did, because we are headed in that direction. Fascism, just to summarize it briefly, is the kind of government you have when the government, although using populist phrases, like broken arbeit, bread and work, is really alienated from the people. Fascism is what you have when violence, such as the assassination of a, of a president, becomes acceptable. And fascism is what you have when a fraud perpetrated by the government and the big lie becomes acceptable because the government is so powerful that individuals and even many publications are afraid to oppose it. Fascism is what you have when there is a question about what happens to the dissenter. The most important thing we have in our way of life, in our form of government, is the fact that the dissenter is usually able to survive, even when he criticizes the most powerful men in government. But we've reached a point in recent years, perhaps because of the development of the industrial warfare machine that Eisenhower warned about, where major magazines and major publications hesitate to criticize the government. And before they take a position, test the wind to see from which way it's blowing. Truth becomes secondary. Justice becomes secondary. Truth is whatever the government uh, wants to be released, and justice is whatever the government wants to happen. We have reached that point, and I want to try and give you a few examples to show you. Now, uh, what I'm going to say tonight, and I'm going to make it short because I know that you have a lot of awards, will probably not be liked by everybody here, but uh, if what I said was liked by everybody here, then I wouldn't be doing it right. Because I want to say things to you that are true, 
And uh, when something is said that is true, the one thing that's predictable is that it will not be liked by everybody. It will be necessary for me to pick a few bones with the great society. Uh, these will be domestic bones, so it won't involve uh, the war in Vietnam or the use of uh, napalm on other human beings, but it will involve the question of whether or not the government has a right to lie because our government has been lying to the people of this country now for nearly four years. You are being fooled. Every man and woman in this country is being fooled. And tonight, I'm going to tell you who is responsible. Now, back in the early 30s, when fascism arrived on the scene in Germany, oddly enough, it arrived in a, in a way that closely parallels the arrival here in November of 1963. The Reichstag fire, if you remember, was clearly set by the Nazis, but a young communist was seized and executed for it. And as a result of this, Everyone was satisfied it had been looked into, and the Nazis, in turn, were able to profit in terms of power from it. This, of course, is the essential technique of fascism, to satisfy the people and cause them to think that they live in the best of all possible worlds. It's not just a fascist technique, it's a totalitarian technique, which the Soviet government perfected many years ago. For example, during the years when Stalin was liquidating his enemies and entrenching his power. There was no mention of it in Pravda, no mention of it in the other Russian journals, except on occasion to point out what monsters these individuals were. More often than not, they disappeared without any sign of their disappearance. The best book that I know of for those of you who would like to see what happens to a country when the management begins to think it has a right to lie, and when the management really thinks it's all right for a powerful government agency to be proud of its immorality, is George Orwell's 1984, and I commend it to you. When it was written in 1949, it was really written about Russia. But if you read it now, you'll find that you're reading about Russia and our own government. This should not be so, but that's the way it is. Because we have reached a point where many people in our government think they have the right to lie. As a matter of fact, no government has ever existed since man arrived on Earth that was more important than the truth. If our government has reached a point where the survival of the government is more important than the truth, then the best thing that could happen would be for it to fall, and we can start building a new government tomorrow morning out of logs. Because we can always build a government, but life is not worth living in a fascist or totalitarian government unless you fight it. And if the government is lying, then you have to fight it. Now, our government is lying, and I want to give you a few examples. What the the United States government did in the Kennedy assassination, and it was a well-planned assassination involving a number of individuals, as you will learn, I assure you. What the government did was to practice two essential actions to conceal the truth of the assassination. One was concealment of evidence, and the other was destruction of evidence. And very briefly, I want to give you some examples of the technique they used in specific terms. Of course, I'm not going to speak about Mr. Shaw's case. I haven't spoken about Mr. Shaw's case since the day we charged him, in spite of what you may have read. On the other hand, I think you would appreciate some statistics. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to give you some, and I'm going to show you what your government has done, and I'm going to tell you why. Now, 
Examples of the destruction of evidence begin with the burning of the autopsy notes by Commander Humes. Of course, one of the most important questions in the entire assassination was the question of the direction of the bullets. Since everybody, as everybody who has looked into the assassination knows, I think without any exception, the fatal shots were fired from the front of the president in order to keep this secret from the people of the United States. The notes of Dr. Humes of the autopsy were burned by Dr. Humes, and he was subsequently promoted. Another case of spontaneous combustion occurred when a CIA memo requested by the Warren Commission was accidentally burned while being thermofaxed. This happened the day after the assassination in Washington. The federal agent who interviewed Oswald in New Orleans, a gentleman named Quigley, burned his notes after the interview. And yet he belongs to an agency whose policy it is never to burn notes. The major landmarks in the Grassy Knoll area where the assassination occurred have been changed. Signs have been moved to make it harder for measurements to be made. Another interesting example of what the government has done is to turn your attention away from the direction where the, where the assassins came from to cause you to look into another spectrum, another area. Uh, I, have to, I have to explain to you now, before I go into this, so that you will understand, uh, because I'm about to talk about political ideology, and you don't know me, so I have to tell you that uh, I certainly don't claim uh, any special merit in it, but my political position is pretty much in the center of the road. We need conservatives, obviously, for stability, and of course we need, we need liberals too, because they give us progress. But one of the, one of the problems in this particular case is, is that everybody has tried to impose their own political ideology on the assassination. For example, friends of mine who are conservatives can't conceive of anybody but an extreme liberal killing the president. And friends of mine who are liberal cannot conceive of anything but an extreme conservative. But of course, neither extreme has a monopoly on virtue, and by the same token, neither extreme has a, a monopoly on murder. And it just happens to be a fact that in this case, the president was murdered by militant members of the right wing. The main function of the Warren Commission, and the reason it was appointed, the main function of the Warren Commission was to conceal the fact that militant right-wing individuals had killed the President of the United States, and also to conceal the fact that individuals connected with the Central Intelligence Agency were involved. Now, with this in mind, <clears throat> you can better appreciate that among the items of evidence destroyed or changed, which is a form of destruction, is uh, in Oswald's notebook. If you were to open Lee Oswald's notebook, one of the first names and phone numbers you see is General Edwin Walker's name. That's Walker there and has his phone number. Now, when the United States government got finished retyping that name into a memo, Walker had become Volke, V-O-L-K-E. Now, I'm just giving that as an example to show you how systematically everything that even touched the right wing, they either eliminated or concealed. It doesn't mean that General Walker is necessarily involved, but the point is the United States government was well aware of where the assassins were located on the, on the political spectrum. And without exception, every case where the trail led to the right the evidence has been destroyed by the government or concealed. You can see it in 72 years or 71 years, but you've got to wait. Now, here's an example of the kind of evidence that they, they concealed. <clears throat> there is a picture in the, in the uh, it's uh, Commission Exhibit 5. There's a commission uh, picture which shows a car park at General Walker's house. 
Now, when this picture was picked up at the Mrs. Payne's, presumably in the hands of Oswald, although there are real questions about that, the license number on the car was clear. There's no question about that. But by the time they printed the picture in the commission exhibits, a large hole had been punched to the license number. So if you want to go to your library and look up commission exhibit number five, you see a car parked at General Walker's house in which the trunk appears to have exploded because someone punched a hole in it. But this is just part of the systematic pattern again and again. For example, uh, one, of the, one of the books which you cannot see, you cannot look at, is uh, called Nazis and Fascists of Today, published in, in Paris. The, uh, the French version is available to you except the government lost all those copies. They just don't have it. The English version, you cannot see for many years. They just don't want you to see it. Again, another form of destruction which has occurred, and I can't say that the government has done this, all I can say is that someone has, is key witnesses. The fact that key witnesses are being destroyed. Nancy Mooney was killed because she knew who was visiting Jack Ruby at his office in the Carousel Club. And Hank Killiam was killed, too, because he knew of the connection between Jack Ruby and Lee Oswald. Incidentally, uh, I might add a connection which was, was so easy to establish that no one can take any credit for it. There simply is no question about the fact that there was a very close relationship between Lee Oswald and Jack Ruby for well over a year. Instances of concealment of evidence by the United States government. Again, another example of how your government thinks that it has the right to lie to you. The autopsy photos, now concealed for nearly four years, 22 color pictures, 18 black and white, 11 x-rays, all concealed. Now remember, the main question, the burning question, was from how many directions was the president shot? And where was he hit? And where did the fatal shot come from? And which shot was the fatal shot? Yet even today, you cannot see the autopsy photographs. And the reason you cannot see them is because they would show that the president was shot from the front, as well as the back. And they would show that the fatal shot came from the front. Now, the witnesses in the Guasinal area, virtually every one of them heard the shots coming from the Guasinal vicinity. And at least one has seen the, one of the individuals behind the, stone, behind the stone wall. These people were not called by the Warren Commission. They were not called by the Warren Commission because they would have testified about the shots coming from the Guasinal area. And you're not supposed to know that. Nor, nor were you told that no firing, no examination was made of the Manlicker Carcano, which Oswald supposedly fired, but never did. No examination was made to determine whether it was fired. They couldn't make an examination of it because of the possibility it may not have been fired. And the reason this position was taken was because of their awareness that he was not involved in the shooting. Oswald's prints, his fingerprints, were not on the rifle although the inference was given that they were. Oswald's fingerprints were not on the Smith & Wesson 38 that killed Tippett, although the inference has been created that they were. Remember, supposedly, Oswald, who did not kill Tippett, supposedly he ran, unloading bullets, as he, uh, cartridges as he ran, and putting in new bullets. Then in the Texas theater, he stood up and yelled, this is it, and supposedly there was a big struggle, and he tried to shoot an officer, and they got the gun from him. Well, when that gun was examined, there was not a fingerprint on it. It had been wiped clean. And the reason it had been wiped clean is Oswald never held it in his hands. Another gratuitous contribution to the, uh, to the scenario by the Dallas police force. And you haven't been told, unless you've made a hobby, or some people have, of looking deeply into it, that the nitrate test indicated that 
Lee Oswald had not fired a rifle that day. There's no question about this. This became so clear that the Warren Commission was forced to take this standard test, which is accepted all over the world, and try to develop a new position that uh, there was a question about it. The allegations of PFC Eugene Dinkin, perhaps my favorite concealed file, bothered me for some time until we heard from an individual who was in PFC Eugene Dinkin's outfit in Germany. Now, the allegations of PFC Dinkin is one of the files that you cannot see for many years. And the reason you cannot see it is that in late 1962 and early 1963, PFC Eugene Dinkin was making the incredible allegation that he was confident that President Kennedy would be assassinated by members of the militant right wing. Now, for some reason, someone in the government is sensitive about that, and you cannot see it. Again, you find that in the permanent carousel cards, which Jack Ruby had and was about to have laminated, which contained some of his closer friends, that in his notes, rather in his notes, which were in his car, one of the addresses he had behind the name Tom Hill was the home address of Robert Welch of the John Birch Society. Now, let me make this point. That doesn't mean that the John Birch Society is involved because they're not. There's no group like that involved. But the point is, since it does indicate a certain degree of right-wing orientation on Jack Ruby's part, no mention is made to you that that address behind Tom Hill's name is the home address in Massachusetts of Robert Welch. Similarly, when the phone calls from uh, Earl Ruby up in Detroit are indicated, they do not tell you how many times Earl Ruby called the James Welch Candy Company in Massachusetts. Suddenly they become very casual about how many calls are made because, again, there's an inference of militant right-wing orientation, and they want to conceal this from you. Again, you have concealed a file entitled Lee Harvey Oswald's Access to Information About the U-2. The reason you can't see that for many years is because you will then realize that Lee Oswald was working for the United States government as a CIA employee, and they don't want you to know that. Again, the Warren Commission investigators and the attorneys for the, the, rather the attorneys for the Warren Commission knew when they saw 544 Camp printed on the pamphlets which Oswald, supposedly a communist, was giving out. When they saw 544 Camp, they knew immediately who was at 544 Camp. This building housed the most conservative, reactionary, the strongest anti-communist in the city of New Orleans, Guy Bannister, in whose office Sergio Arcacha and David Ferry, who did know Oswald very well, from whose office they operated. But they treated that en passant as if it had no significance at all, because, again, they did not want you to know that President Kennedy was killed as a result of a militant right-wing plot. Now, again, you are being fooled. Oswald did not fire a gun. He did not shoot anybody. And the United States government has to know it. There cannot possibly be any question in their mind. And if there remains anyone in this audience who thinks that the members of the Warren Commission have any innocence left in this regard, let me just call to your attention that long before they ceased functioning on the Warren Commission, long before that, the burning question was from how many directions did the shots come and where was the president hit? And nevertheless, not a single member of the seven, not one, not one member of the Warren Commission looked at the photographs of the autopsy or looked at the x-ray pictures because they knew what they would see. They knew the president had been shot from the front and they did not want to lose their innocence. There's no other possible explanation for that. Now, despite the concealment and the destruction of evidence, 
There are examples of how the Warren Commission conclusion is fraudulent within the Warren Commission itself. And I'm just going to give you a few examples here, very briefly, but if you want to note them down with a pencil, you can go look at the, at the Warren Commission exhibits in your library, and I think after you look at them, you'll realize that the conclusion is untrue. For example, if you look at Commission Exhibit 392, you'll see that Dr. McClellan has indicated the cause of death as a gunshot wound of the temple. Commission Exhibit 392, by the time they realized it was out apparently, it was too late, so they've colored the paper very dark so it's a little hard for you to read. But if you look close, you'll see it's a gunshot wound of the temple. And of course, unless they've changed it, in the meanwhile, the book depository used to be behind where the president was. Again, the Warren Commission indicated to you and to the American people that Oswald must have learned Russian on his bunk at night and studying because he was such a Marxist, such a communist, he wanted to get over to Russia. And yet, a slip of the tongue occurred during the testimony of Commander Folsom. And if you look at the Folsom exhibit, the Folsom testimony, rather, in the testimony section, you'll find Commander Folsom referring to Oswald's grade in an Armed Forces Russian examination, PRT 21, Practical Russian Test 21, United States Army Examination. He was taught Russian by the United States government, the same government which employed him, the same government which ultimately framed him because this government believes that it's all right to tell lies. You recall that Oswald is supposed to have been a Russian defector, and yet one of his first jobs on his return from Russia was at Jagger Stover Childs, which is a company which did high-level, high-security work for the United States government, including photography and special kind of map work. And again, in 1963, in summer of 63 in New Orleans, when this communist defector sought a passport, he got one in 24 hours. Now, the other individuals who applied on that day did not get it in 24 hours. But Oswald got his, a passport to go to Europe, Spain, many other places, in 24 hours. And as, as most of you know, this is not possible, not to even get a passport, if you are truly a defector. Now, another example of the Lee Oswald, Jack Ruby relationship. There are many witnesses available, and it's no problem for any prosecutor who's concerned about bringing out the truth to develop eyewitnesses who saw Ruby and Oswald together, not merely in Dallas, but in many other towns. That just was not that hard. But if you want to see an example in the Warren Commission itself, or a few examples, I'll give you some places to look. First of all, I think many of you are already familiar with the fact that Jack Ruby had a business relationship with Bertha Cheek, and that Lee Oswald was living in the house run by Bertha Cheek's sister, Earlene Roberts, at 1026 North Beckley. This didn't arouse the Commission's interest at all. Of course, uh, it didn't arouse the Commission's interest even when eyewitnesses saw them together and, and at the Carousel Club, such as, for example, the date of November the 10th. If you look at uh, Lee Oswald's address book, you will see the number FR5, 5591. This is the phone number of Kenneth Cody, FR5, 5591. Who is Kenneth Cody? He's the uncle of Joe Cody on the police force, who in his testimony before the Warren Commission admitted that he's been a very close friend of Jack Ruby's for many years, for many years. Again, if you look at Oswald's address book, you will see PE8-1951. You'll see it several times in volume 16 in Oswald's address book. PE8-1951. 
On June the 10th and June the 11th of 1963, Jack Ruby called that number twice. It's a number in Fort Worth. When Jack Ruby called that number, he was in New Orleans, and Oswald was in New Orleans. Now, there are not a great many people in this room, but I doubt if there's anybody in this room that has in their address book any numbers which I have in mind. And yet this was not a matter of curiosity to the Commission at all. And the reason it was not a curiosity, I'm sure, is that they were very well aware, very well aware of the fact that there was indeed a close relationship between Lee Oswald and Jack Ruby. It just isn't even close. They had to know it. So when they pretended that Ruby did not know Oswald, and pretended that he killed him because he did not want Jackie Kennedy to come down and testify in court. Your government was lying to you again, just as they lie to you now. When uh, Ramsey Clark announces that we have charged an innocent man, surely a statement which has never been made in history by an attorney general of the United States in charge of the the very division is supposed to be concerned about government attempting to torpedo and advance the state's case. When he does that, and when the Chief Justice of the United States announces from Tokyo that he's seen nothing new in our case, I don't know what he was doing in Tokyo, presumably inspecting the Seventh Fleet, but whatever he was doing down there, he has to know that he will never know what our case is about until we come in court. And he was performing a function. For whom was he performing a function? For whom was Ramsey Clark performing? Who is responsible for the continued obstruction to the first honest investigation that this country's had into the assassination? Harry Truman had a sign on his desk when he was president which says, the buck stops here. Who appointed the Warren Commission? Who was aware that there was a CIA problem and caused this seven-man commission to be composed of the former head of the CIA, Alan Dulles, the best friend the CIA has in the Senate, Senator Richard Russell, the best friend that the CIA has in the House, Congressman Gerald Ford, and the former head of the OSS, out of which the CIA grew, John J. McCloy. The commission waited in advance by defenders of the CIA. Who appointed Ramsey Clark, who's done his best to torpedo the investigation in the case? Who controls the CIA? Who controls the FBI? Who controls the archives, where this evidence is locked up for so long that it is unlikely that there is anybody in this room that will be alive when it's released. This is really your property and the property of the people in this country. Who has the arrogance and the brass to prevent the people in this country from seeing that evidence? Who indeed? The one man who has profited most from the assassination, your friendly president, Lyndon Johnson. And don't be fooled, don't be fooled by the humility and the picking up of faggots. Don't be fooled by that. The question is, when do we get to see the evidence about the murder of John Kennedy? That's the question. And he's the man who's responsible for hiding it. I've leaned over backwards for months now while our phones have been monitored, while the government has done everything it could to torpedo with the investigation, because they know we stumbled on it, and I claim no virtue. We are not great investigators. It was largely luck. We stumbled on it. But we did stumble on it, and we do know what happened, and it won't even be close. There won't be any acquittals if we can get these people to trial if we can get them to trial, if we can prevent the U.S. government from 
blowing up our case or finding a way to remove me from office. If we get him to trial, you will learn what happened to John Kennedy and who killed him. And you will then learn that you've been living under a government now for four years, which has concealed evidence and destroyed evidence and lied to you again and again and again. Now, I don't say that President Johnson is involved in the assassination. I have no reason to know that he is. But I do think this. I do think that the fact that he has profited from the assassination more than any other man makes it imperative that he see that the evidence is released so that we can know he's not involved rather than assume it. Of course I assume that the President of the United States is not involved, but wouldn't it be nice to know it? Wouldn't it be nice to know that people who backed him for years in Texas are not involved? Of course we'll assume it, but wouldn't it be nice to know that? Is this a great society which allows innocents to be butchered as Oswald was, with no concern, no interest, which allows the guilty, the murderers, to walk the streets, knowing without any question who they are, knowing what happened. Is this a great society? Is it a great society which causes blackouts in news centers like New York when there's a development in the case which pressures governors so that if the district attorney of New Orleans, who is prosecuting the case, tries to get a man back from Ohio or Texas or Missouri or Iowa so that he can never get him back. When prior to that point, extraditions were automatic. <clears throat> is this a great society which monitors your phone if it has the slightest bit of curiosity about you? This is not a great society. This is a dangerous society, a society which, despite the lip service to populism and the lip service to good things and material things and economic things, is so morally threadbare that the futures of your children are in danger. It raises a question as to whether the Constitution itself might not accidentally have been burned to a crisp by now. So now we come to you of the press who are here tonight because the real need is for your help. To be blunt about it, the press of America has been apathetic. The press has been consumed with inertia since the assassination. The questions the press asks about me and raises about me are a very healthy thing. If I can't survive it, then I'm in the wrong business. I don't care what questions they raise about the case because I know we can win our cases. That's the way it should be. And if the press has any doubts about me, if they think I'm politically ambitious, if they really think that I would charge somebody for some kind of personal gain, then they should raise the question. That's fine because I'll survive it and I'll answer the questions. But why don't they ask these questions that demand to be asked of the President of the United States? Have we reached a point where the President is so powerful that the press is afraid to ask him, President Johnson, why cannot we see these hidden files? Are they so afraid of the golden eagle that is the presidential emblem? So afraid of the power now massed in Washington that we have become a fascist country? It's really up to you from now on, because I've already had an example, and so have you, of what can happen after the convictions. We obtained a major conviction already, conviction of Dean Andrews, for perjury in connection with this case. And most of the country doesn't even know the details yet. It just didn't get out. 
and it might well be the same when other convictions occur. So if America ever needed the press, it needs the press today. And let me tell you something about that. The most important thing that this country has ever given the world, and the thing for which we will be remembered, is the Bill of Rights. We took a big step forward from all the rest of history in connection with the concern of government for the rights of individuals. But these rights don't mean anything unless the press is concerned. What rights, for example, did Lee Oswald have in Dallas? He had no rights. He saw no lawyer. He had no rights at all. He was framed by people in law enforcement. The U.S. government helped. He had no rights at all. But if the press had been concerned enough in Dallas, they would not have dared to do this. And if the press in this country can just get concerned about what the present administration is doing about the lie that is being perpetrated about the fact that the men who killed Jack Kennedy are still loose and untouched by justice, then the president cannot continue to get away with turning his back on the problem. And that's what he's doing. And he must not be allowed to do it because this country does not belong to him. It belongs to you and 200 million men and women and children. So let me just say this, that if you ever wait for an opportunity to do something for your profession, and do something for your country, then you have such an opportunity as no one has had since being a reporter became a profession. If you can just get interested, if you can only get interested, because your country needs you now, as it never has before. Thank you. Following Mr. Garrison's speech, there was a question-and-answer period. Most of those attending the banquet were newsmen, and hence this resembled an informal press conference. The first question to Mr. Garrison was, do you believe that anyone within the framework of the United States government helped plot the assassination? Why did the government hide evidence? And third, who really killed Jack Kennedy? First of all, employees, uh, a limited number, I should say, Employees of the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States government are involved in assassination. Uh, a number of them have been identified. Secondly, in my judgment, the reason that the United States government, meaning the present administration, Lyndon Johnson's administration, is obstructing the, any investigation, any further investigation, the reason they concealed the true facts are to be blunt about it, in order to protect the individuals involved with the assassination of John Kennedy. As to the third question, that involves names, and I cannot possibly go into that at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, let me add that Mr. Garrison wanted me to make mention that he cannot answer any questions regarding Clay Shaw's trial, which should be coming up sometime next year. The next question was, why the tacit approval of the Kennedy family of the Warren Commission report? Uh, yes, sir. I don't want to be unfair to Senator Kennedy, and I think if I tried to speculate without having the facts, I would be unfair. For example, the comments which I made about the president were comments made as a result of specific facts that we had after months of forbearance. On the other hand, I don't know enough about the Kennedy's reasons to guess. I'm curious, too. I don't understand it, but I don't know. Next, Garrison was asked, how did you stumble onto the story? I didn't mean it in that way. What I meant was uh, we stumbled onto the case itself. Uh, if we had not uh, uh, 
got uh, curious about the on trip that David Ferry made driving through a thunderstorm all night to go ice skating in Houston and the fact that he did not go ice skating there. If we had not seen that and continued to be curious about it, we would not have found our way into the whole thing because they had cut off an insulation of every possible kind. We just happened to find ourselves in the intermediate area right below the level of the sponsors or financers and right above the level of what you might call the operating level, the people who pull the trigger. And we stumbled into it by luck. That's what I meant, not as a result of skill. But because we didn't let go and we kept on digging, we had other luck later on and came across the other individuals. What I, now the other part, uh, if you mean with regard to the fact that I now bring up for the first time the fact that it's very plain to us that the President of the United States bears the responsibility, the total responsibility, for the obstruction and concealment of the development of the truth in this matter is something that we have known for months. But I wanted to lean over backwards because it's so easy to say it. And I'm sure there will be replies that this is a right statement. But there's no question about it. It's the executive order which comes from the President that postponed your seeing the evidence for 75 years. But we've wanted to lean over backwards, and we have, and we've tried to get cooperation. It's become hopeless. Uh, I don't uh, want to criticize Ramsey Clark. I think he's a harmless sort of little fellow who has no idea what's happening. But, uh, well, his father was on the Supreme Court, so he's head of the Justice Department. <laughs> but uh, the responsibility is in the President's lap. And the time has come to bring it out, but we have known that for some time. Another question. Mr. Garrison, you made the statement that the main function of the Warren Commission was to conceal the right-wing militants who killed the president. The Warren Commission was appointed by President Johnson and composed of people such as Chief Justice Warren, whom certain right-wing groups have attacked and asked for his removal. Is it your charge that the president appointed him, among others, in order to conceal the facts of the assassination? Uh, it's a very good question, but I think the function of, uh, of appointing uh, Chief Justice uh, was to obtain what you might call a liberal compromise, because as a result, uh, it was, I think, an ingenious appointment. As a result, uh, the Warren Commission and its conclusions had and now have strong backing from the liberal element of the country. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's a certain amount of support uh, from the conservative element because of the presence of Congressman Gerald Ford on the commission. I think it was, uh, that was probably a major reason for it. Now, I don't know, because I cannot go into the man's mind, that uh, when he appointed the commission a week after the assassination, that this was his precise concern at the time. I think the makeup of the commission makes it quite evident that there was at that time a concern about the involvement of individuals connected with the CIA. And it might well be that during the course of that inquiry, they then became protective of the status quo. The Dallas police scenario, somewhere along that time, was adopted as the official truth. But I think the essential reason for the appointment of Chief Justice Warren was to obtain the support of, of liberals for the Warren Commission. Next, Garrison was asked, why would Chief Justice Warren, who has never been identified as a right-winger, conceal a right-wing plot? I have no idea. You're going to have to ask Chief Justice Warren. Another question. If you criticize the government for concealing evidence, may we ask why you, as a member of the government, will not reveal to us the demonstrable proof that you have as to who killed President Kennedy? Here's Garrison's answer. As a prosecutor, I am not allowed to reveal to you my evidence until the case comes to trial. If I reveal my evidence to you in order to make you happy, and I'd love to do it, I won't be able to convict the defendant. This line of questioning continues. Does that mean that you are charging the defendant with the murder of the president? Garrison. Well, the defendant has already been charged with conspiracy to murder the president. Yes, it's written down in black and white. Question. Was there CIA money that went into the full-page ad in that Dallas paper on the day preceding the assassination? The ad was in the paper on the day of the assassination, as I recall. Uh, no, uh, I don't think it was CIA money for that particular ad. I don't think for that particular ad. Another question. 
What did the president do to incur the wrath of the right wing? Well, suppose I just give you three things off the top of my head. I, I, I could... <laughs> what did Franklin D. Roosevelt do to incur the wrath of the right wing? Don't you realize that the militant, the extreme right wing, felt that they had uh, another Franklin D. Roosevelt from their point of view? Uh, in my judgment, I have to say this ahead of time so you won't misunderstand, I happen to think that John Kennedy was a good president, and I feel rather strongly about that. But from their point of view, here were their concerns. First of all, it was obvious that he was, he was bringing to an end the Cuban adventure. Bringing it to an end. And the certain, certain steps had been taken to a to a rapprochement, to a, to a detente with Fidel Castro. And it was plain that an understanding was being worked out whereby there would be no more raids, no more plans to take over Cuba. Again, in the same direction, it was plain that the president was bringing an end to the Cold War, was becoming concerned about the billions of dollars being spent for the Cold War was thinking about the possibility of trying to understand Russia better. I don't mean that he was going to dismantle our defenses, but he was reaching for an understanding. And it's quite apparent, too, that he did not intend to expand the war in Vietnam. And as far as Texas and Texans are concerned, he left no doubt about the fact that he was headed directly for the 27.5% deduction the 27.5% deduction is something very dear to some people in Texas. Now, that's just a few for openers. Here a note might be in order. 27.5% is the oil depletion allowance. Another question. Do you still feel that David Ferry possibly did not die of natural causes, and if so, why? And by what method do you think Jack Ruby met his end? Here is Mr. Garrison's answer. I don't know about Jack Ruby uh, because I don't have enough data about uh, his death to know, and I don't want to speculate. The way that Dave Ferry appears to have killed himself uh, appears to be uh, an overdose of proloid, P-R-O-L-O-I-D, which is uh, really nothing but uh, the old-fashioned thyroid pill. If you if, if you're hypothyroid and you have low, low thyroid, if you have a thyroid deficiency, then uh, taking proloid doesn't hurt you at all, and it, uh, it, it beefs up your metabolism. On the other hand, uh, Ferry had a serious high blood pressure problem, and if you have high blood pressure of a serious nature and you take an overdose of proloid, it's predictable that you will have a brain aneurysm, which is what Ferry had. It leaves no evidence for the coroner to find in the usual examination except a high iodine content in the blood. No check was made of the blood content of iodine, and a nearly empty bottle of proloid was found in the, among the bottles of this man with extremely high blood pressure. Uh, this, is a, this is a layman's opinion. I've talked to pathologists about it. We don't have a medical conclusion yet, but this does appear to be the likely uh, way in which he committed suicide. That was New Orleans District Attorney James Garrison speaking to the award dinner of the Southern California Broadcasters Association at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles. The speech was recorded by Paul and Shirley Eberly of the Los Angeles Free Press, who have graciously allowed us to broadcast these tapes here. Production for Pacifica is by Leonard Brown. This has been Leonard Brown. Okay, we're here with James DiEugenio. He's the editor and publisher of Kennedy'sandking.com. I, I think this is either late 67 or early 68, um, very early 68. It's a, it's a banquet for the Southern California Broadcaster Association at the Century Plaza Hotel. And I think it was the L.A. Free Press who invited Garrison there. They had an article about him on the front page, which he refers to in the talk. When he's talking about art, 
the guy named Art. That's Art Konkin. Art Konkin was the owner and publisher of the L.A. Free Press. The L.A. Free Press was, wow, what, where do you begin with this? In my opinion, there were two paradigms of journalism, two peaks of journalism in the 1960s, which nobody has matched since. For a glossy magazine, it was Warren Hinkle's Ramparts, which nobody has come close to ever since it was killed off. For a weekly tabloid, it was the L.A. Free Press. Not even the Village Voice in its heyday came close to being as great as the L.A. Free Press was. And those were two standards of journalism that if you don't know about them, you should look it up. Because it, it's really what made the 60s the 60s. That They weren't afraid to go anywhere. And this included supporting Jim Garrison, which almost nobody did. All right, after Garrison was so harshly attacked uh, in the early part of the summer of 1967, if you recall, it was by Hugh Ainsworth in Newsweek, by James Phelan in the Saturday Evening Post, and then by Walter Sheridan in his NBC special. We all know, of course, all three of those guys were interlinked with each other. They knew each other quite well. They worked with each other. Uh, Sheridan actually employed Phelan. Uh, Ainsworth was actually infiltrated into Shaw's defense team. Uh, Phelan testified at Shaw's trial. Sheridan was in contact with the CIA, and he was getting funding from the CIA through a local law firm down there, Monroe and Lemon. Once that hit, that three-pronged attack, most of the media turned on Garrison. In fact, almost all of them did. This, of course, led to Garrison sort of calling out the media for being so bad on the JFK case, which they were. It also led him to get more extreme in his message, like he begins his talk on this with comparing what America has become after the assassination of JFK, and I might say Malcolm X also, hmm. all right, with Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King to come, all right, acts of fascism that if a government can lie so blatantly about something as important as the John F. Kennedy assassination, that means that they can basically get away with murder, you know, which of course is what they did. You know, and he names a very famous article that was published around this time. I think it was in the Saturday Evening Post, but I'm not sure. Tom Braden, who was masquerading as a journalist at that time, wrote an article saying something like, the title was, Glad the CIA is Immoral. Very few people knew that Tom Braden was a former CIA agent, okay, at, you know, when, when that article was published, all right? They certainly knew after it was published, All right? Um, and so Garrison mentions that article. This is his um, beginning to really go head to head with the Central Intelligence Agency around this time. You know, he did the same thing in his Playboy interview. He then talks about the obstruction, excuse me, the destruction and alteration of several pieces of evidence. The lying about pieces of evidence, for example, uh, the FBI failed to find any prints on the rifle. All right, it's strongly suggesting that the Dallas police put them on there after the fact. All right, he talked about a very, very seldomly mentioned witness at that time, Eugene Dinkin, who was in the military at that time, and he was. One of the people who actually predicted the JFK assassination in advance, along with Richard Case Nagel and Rose Sheremy. All right, there's an article on Kennedy's and King.com 
about Eugene Dink, and I think it's one of the better articles that have ever been written about him. So take a look at that if you don't know if you don't know who he is. He talks about the hidden files on Oswald and the U2, which of course is a very important piece of evidence the CIA did not want to let uh, give away at that time. And he talks about the attempt to camouflage Oswald being at 544 Camp Street. And there is one piece of evidence in the Warren Commission volumes. I think it's in volume 26. And it's the Corliss Lamont flyer, The Crime Against Cuba, which the FBI slipped up on and let that into the commission volumes. But we know through the work of other researchers like John Newman that the FBI either whited out references to 544 Camp Street or they changed it to 531 Lafayette, Hmm. okay, which is the – the other uh, address to that building, all right? So he, he's correct about that. Now, there's something I think he's wrong about. It's not his fault he's wrong. It's because the executive sessions of the Warren Commission had not been declassified at this time. He says the Warren Commission didn't have the autopsy photos and the x-rays. There's a couple of references in those executive sessions to the fact that they actually did. The Warren Commission itself has tried to cut co- they tried to cover this up for decades. You know, I'm not talking about just a few years. They tried to cover this up for decades. You know, people like uh Arlen Specter, people like David Bellin, etc. You know, uh, people like John McCloy, you know, they they essentially lied in public about this. All right, that they did not have the photographs and x-rays. But in a, when the ARB was created in the 1990s, all the executive sessions of the Warren Commission were declassified, and there is a reference there where John McCloy talks about how they have a room now where the autopsy materials are located. All right Now, what I believe happened is I believe that only – the Warren Commissioners had access to those exhibits. I don't think the lawyer staff did. All right. I think Gerald McKnight agrees with me on that in his book, Breach of Trust. All right. Oh, and he talks about a witness who wrote a document about a gunshot wound to the right temple. Well, David Mantic in his book, JFK's Head Wounds, all right, which is available, I think, on uh, Amazon. In an ebook form, he lists today we have about several witnesses because of declassified files by the ARB about the uh, who say they saw a gunshot wound to the right temple. Um, one of the better ones being Charles, I think his name is Charles Robinson, who was uh, working for Gawler's Funeral Parlor and who came to the morgue uh, to pick up the body and um, he told the House Select Committee that in the hairline of JFK's right temple, he saw what he thought was a gunshot wound and he filled it in with wax. Hmm. So yeah, so you know back then there might have only been one witness, but today there are several to this. All right. And he talks about the Russian test and the passport Oswald got in about 24 hours, that's accurate also, which of course makes us very suspicious of Oswald going to the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War uh, and then being allowed to come back with a Russian wife. And not only is he not court-martialed, according to the CIA, they didn't even debrief him. You know, Even the white Russians that were interviewed by the Warren Commission found this hard to believe. You know, the Russians just don't do that. They don't let a guy who defected going back to the United States leave with his spouse at the very same time. You know, it just doesn't not doesn't happen. You know, so it's very, you know, that whole subject of Oswald and the intelligence community, there's going to be a lot more to come out on this. All right, because of some work that Malcolm Blunt has done, a very good British researcher, he sent me 
six packets of files on the work that Betsy Wolf had done for the House Select Committee on trying to figure out why Oswald's files went to one and only one place during the defection and they went to the wrong place. All right. And an interview he did with a guy named Pete Bagley, who worked with James Angleton. I think it was his third in command. All right. Behind Ray Roca. And there'll be a lot more to say about this. And I think it's going to be very, very important. Garrison was right about that, too, of course. That's what I'm trying to say. But we've come so far since he made this speech. So one way to look at him is as a kind of pioneer on a new frontier. All right, and then he, I love the question he asked at the end. When do we get to see all the evidence? Hmm. Well, this is 54 years later, and we still haven't seen it all. Okay, so he was complaining in 67, early 68. Here we are, the new millennium, 2018, and Trump still delays it. Supposed to be all declassified in October, and here we are still waiting for it. All right. You know? I mean, come on. How ridiculous can you possibly get? All right? And then at the end of the speech, I agree that, you know, Oswald's rights were violated uh, when he was in detention. And number two, where was the press to complain about those things? For instance... I don't think Oswald was actually arraigned for the assassination of JFK. All right. There's a very long debate about this. There's some new information that's come out. And, you know, there's that famous interview with Oswald when somebody was asking. Uh, I think the words were something like, did you kill President Kennedy? He says, no, I haven't been charged with that. And the guy comes back and says, well, according to the police, you have. And he has a very puzzled look on his face. You know, so I think it's an open question whether he was actually arraigned for that. I'm pretty sure he was arraigned for the Tippett shooting, but there's an open question of when, when and uh, where he was arraigned, you know, uh, for, the, uh, for the murder of JFK. And, of course, he did not have an attorney, you know, for the, if, if he was arraigned. You know, which he should have had. And so Garrison asked, you know, where was the press and all? So, well, the, obviously, most of the press was backing the Warren Commission without even reading it. Right. And then when Garrison came along, they were attacking Garrison. You know, so th that's where the press was. By the way, Garrison did several of these. Um, you have one of them here. But as time went on and the funding for his operation was becoming depleted because he was being attacked for using local funds, you know, out of his fines and fees collection uh, to finance his investigation by the local papers. And then the supposed group that was going to back him, Truth and Consequences, faded away. You know, he had to do these things. He had to travel all over the country and do these speeches uh, to groups like this and also to universities and things like that to, so he wouldn't have to pay for it, the investigation himself, which, by the way, he did anyway. So that's why he was doing these things. Believe me, he didn't want to do these. He'd rather be back in his office supervising the investigation. You know, but that's how he got, you know, he got stuck in this situation. So this is an interesting talk. I, I'm glad you found it. All right. Uh, I, I imagine it's from the Pacifica Archive, right? Yeah, definitely is. All right. So I, I urge everybody to listen to this. It's kind of interesting. This is Our Hidden History.
This is Our Hidden History.